Chapter 3. Yay! We covered part of Chapter 3 already when we were doing limits. We're not going to do that again. We're going to skip over that limit business and move on to something called extrema. Huh. Yeah. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. So let's talk about what we're going to do. We're going to talk about what an extrema is in a function. Oh. What? Uh -oh. Why are you late? Do you want to buy no, get in here. Now I'm on video yelling at you. I'm going to edit it later so I don't lose my job. Uh, yeah, so then uh, we're going to find extreme on a close interval and an open interval. Close interval where you include the endpoints, open interval you don't include the endpoints. And then, of course, you should be able to have your fingers. Everybody? Good. Anybody not? Oh, we're good? Okay, excellent. Smitty, what can you tell me that's interesting about that picture? What's special about various points on the graph? Pick whatever point you'd like. Um, there's a close. Oh! <laughs> What's a password? I'm sorry, what? Shh, I can't hear the password. Close enough. <laughs> 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 I pray better than I love Calc, so. Uh, <laughs> points never hurts. Back to you, Smitty. Okay. Um, at the bottom left, there's a closed point. Doesn't oh, nice. It's a solid dot, so we're going to include that point, right? Yeah. Excellent. Keep going. What else you got? Uh, on the other side, it goes up forever. It does. Good. Yeah. Closed interval on the left. Very open on the right. Excellent. What else? I'm sorry? Thank you, Smitty. You taking over? You okay with him taking over? That's cool. Thank yeah. you. I thought you'd see it that way. It has three x intercepts. Correct. That's where the function equals zero. So f of x equals zero. So, you know, algebra pre count stuff. Good. Matthew, keep going. Um, it has two turning points and goes through the origin. It has two turning points. I'm a little shaky on turning points. Could you explain, please? Uh, I don't know when the slope changes from going positive to negative. Wouldn't that be a zero? Um, yeah. There's two zeros and also goes through zero, zero. But it does it three times, right? Which, let me, let me clarify, what turning points are you talking about? Where on the graph approximately are you talking about? Uh, like one and a half and then one and a half. Are you referring to X. this point yeah. and that point? Yeah. And you're calling those turning points? Yeah. Because? Because they turn there. What turns? The line. Or not the line, the, uh, the function. This is the international symbol for keep going. I don't. Uh, so it'll be very effective on the video. We're referring to like the uh, the function or. You're driving this bus. Slow. Mason saying slow. Anybody? Why are those turning points? As he, I mean, we'll use his we'll use his vernacular for a little while. What makes that a turning point? Again, international symbol for keep going. Vertices. vertices. Yeah, yeah. One is vertex, two are vertices. Yeah. Like octopus, octopi, plural, ancient, cactus, cacti, <laughs> Jesus, 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 <laughs> school bus, school by. <laughs> How do we get? Oh, vertices. Yeah. Oh. Are they vertices? No. No, why not? Usually it's your parabola. And parabolas have vertices. This this is actually a cubic. Doesn't have a, 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 a vertice. But I understand what you're trying. They kind of look like parabolas, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're but they're not. Um, Conrad. Yeah. Where's <laughs> such an enthusiastic response? I love it. Where's the lowest point on the graph? 
Uh, it seems to be about that dot at the bottom left. I'll, I'll give you that. Where's the highest point on the graph? Uh, infinity that way. Well, okay, good. <laughs> Anything else we want to talk about? The focus of today's lesson is going to be those blue circles that Matthew called the turning points. Um, we're going to use the terminology extrema, and we're going to delve a little bit into that. So, here's a bunch of fancy schmancy calculus speak. I wouldn't write a word of that down, except for some terminology. So let's go back to this picture. These circles that we have, or these, I should say, the points that Matthew pointed out, are what's called extrema. And we have, this is where things get confusing because we have different terminology depending on what source you're looking at. The AP switches back and forth between some of these things. So let's go back to the question that I asked Conrad. I asked you where's the lowest point on the graph and you told me where this dot is, right? Yeah. Okay, that's called a global, global min. Min short for minimum. However, sometimes they're also called absolute. I prefer absolute, but global also shows up. That's the very lowest point anywhere on the graph. And then the second question I asked you was, well, where's the highest point on the graph? And you told me? Infinity that way. Correct. And since you can't get to infinity, this graph actually doesn't have a global max or an absolute max. Absolute max, or I'll put global in parentheses this time just to confuse things. None. Okay? Because remember, infinity is not a number, it's a concept, and it goes on and on and on. You can't ever get to the highest point, therefore, it doesn't have an absolute max. Okay, so are we okay with those two terms? It takes into account the entire picture. Now we start looking at chunks of the graph. And if, for instance, I look at this chunk of the graph, within that little chunk, it also has a maximum, which Matthew called turning points. Are you with me on that concept? Okay, that is called a relative max. It's the biggest, or I don't want to say biggest, it's the highest point at a certain little chunk of the graph. So then you might be asking yourself, self, well, how big of a chunk are we talking about for the graph? Like, what if we talked about a sine graph? You know, sine graph has a bunch of those top, uh, maximums. How many does it have? Well, it depends on the size of the chunk. For our purposes, we're going to talk about small areas being chunks. Okay, so that rectangle that I drew is, is actually a pretty big chunk. But it's still, who is it? Me, that helps. <laughs> Are you crazy? Me. Thank you. I'll cherish it always. It could help be fantastic. Oh, I see Luke, the sneaky guy, moved the desk over. <laughs> yeah. You're not so dumb. This up to you. Okay, so if I have this as my chunk, anybody want to guess what that thing's called? Relative min. Overbite error. So any graph, any function can have only one absolute max. One absolute min. Okay, so a graph can have only one absolute max and absolute min. It can have an infinite number of relative maxes and mins. Okay, does that make sense? Yes? So again, if you think about a sine graph that goes on forever and ever and ever, a sine graph, strangely enough, has no 
absolute maxes and mins, but it's got an infinite number of relative maxes and mins. We're going to focus most of our energy on relative maxes and mins. Uh, we'll throw some absolutes in there every once in a while. That's what that says. Now, let's go back. I'm jumping around like a fart in a windstorm. I'm sorry. Um, Matthew, let's go back to you. If we talk about that maximum turning point that you brought up before, um, we could take an algebra approach to it and say, well, that's the point in that area with the biggest y value. Right? Everybody with me? Okay, good. Let's talk about it from a calculus standpoint. If I go to the left of that relative max over here, what can you tell me about the slope of the tangent line to the function? Positive. Positive. Did you read it? Did you read the graph up right? Positive. You can be weird and read it correctly. Wait, you're not answering my question, though. Okay. You're getting ahead of yourself. Okay. Your answer was correct. It's positive. I don't care what direction we're coming from. Okay. It's still positive over here, right? Sure. Yeah? yeah? What happens at that point? What can you tell me about the slope of the tangent line there? Good. And how about to the left? Negative. Sorry, that's to the right. I have trouble. I have to do this. You know, L is left. I used to put it on my shoes, but I don't want to write it on my shoes anymore. So I'm sorry, what is it? Uh, slope is negative. Good. Okay. So from a calculus standpoint, how does that translate? Well, the derivative then to the left of that max is positive. The derivative to the right of that max is minimum. Oh, sorry, is minimum. Is negative. Okay. Positive slope, negative slope. Changing colors. What about at that guy, Matthew? What's the slope of the tangent line to the left of that? Negative. Already got that, and then over to the right? Positive. Positive. Okay. Will that always happen? No. For the rest of you, will that always happen? In other words, if I have a relative max, Will it always be positive on the uh, left and negative on the right? If I have a relative min, will it always be negative on the left, positive on the right? You're shaking your head yes? Awesome. Anybody else? Yes or no? You're saying yes, Mason? Good. Okay. And we're going we're gonna to use calculus to do this. So if this were an algebra class, you would just probably plug and chug numbers into a t-chart. Keep getting closer and closer and find it. Or it, you'd be working with a parabola where you find the vertex. And in fact, you did this in pre-calc, I think, where you found uh, the vertex of parabolas to find that high point or that low point of the graph. We're going to start using calculus. Okay. So the biggest value in a small region is a max. The smallest value in a region is the min. And as I said, we're going to focus on the relative max and relative min. We're doing okay so far with concepts, yes? All right, awesome. How do we find those points? Well, suppose I didn't give you a cool graph. I just gave you a function and said, hey, where's all the relative max and mins in that graph? Here's how you do it. Okay. Now, let's first talk about some terminology here. What's a critical number? Okay, because that's kind of a big jump. One, find the critical numbers. Well, that's tough if you don't know what a critical number is. A critical number is a value for x where the derivative equals 0. If I click back to the picture again, we talked about this already, but both of those relative max and the relative min has a tangent line that has a slope of 0. And the derivative is this tangent line, so therefore wherever the derivative equals 0. Take the derivative, set it equal to 0, solve, you get your critical numbers. Then part of the challenge is going to be, okay, well, I got this critical number. The critical number means something happens there. Is it a max? Is it a min? For these guidelines, however, this is for absolute max and min. So if you have an absolute, if you go back to the graph, it's either going to happen at a relative max or min, or it's going to be one of the endpoints. 
That's why it says finding absolute extrema up at the top. We won't spend a ton of time on that, but it is something we should practice. Mr. Olson, how are you? Good, how are you? Fantastic. Okay, so let's try one. I got a cortic. Do you have any idea what a cortic looks like? It's okay, you don't have to. Looks like a W most of the time, but that's irrelevant. I want to find the absolute extrema of this function. So it's going to be one of two places. It's either going to be one of the turning points, i.e. relative maximum in, or it's going to be one of the endpoints. Okay, so let's start this first. Take the derivative of that, set it equal to zero, solve, and tell me where those critical numbers are, please. Excuse me, sorry. It's, uh, whatever I had for lunch is. Oh. Please. I did that. I did the hard part for you. What'd you do then? Say that again. Oh, well, there we go. I need to get there eventually. So since we're doing an absolute, I find the easiest way to do this is to make a t-chart. Going back to some algebra one stuff. Zero, one. But I have to include negative one and two, because those are the endpoints. Using your calculators, we're going to do this together on your calculator, so please get them out. I will show you two different ways that you can easily fill in that t-chart. Whichever method you want to use is entirely up to you. Now, realistically speaking, some of these will be ridiculously easy. Like, I know automatically if x is 0, then f of x is 0. But we're going to pretend we're not that smart. Okay. Method number one, put the original function into y1 then go to the table. Is it safe to assume that doesn't require further explanation? Yeah, or does it? Okay. Method number two, my preferred method, but you can do whatever you want, this is America, if I can follow right on, would be to type 3x to the fourth minus 4x cubed in the home screen. Then I would store zero. So you, you simply say zero, store, x, enter. Then bring the function up again and hit enter. It'll give you a value. Zero. Then you go one, store, x. Go back up to the value, hit enter. Or you get the table. Can you give me the values off that table, please? What is it when uh, x equals 1? Um, negative 1. And when x equals negative 1? 7. And when x equals 2? 16. Beautiful. Thank you for the help. You used the table there, right? Yeah. Just okay. after, I just put the normal equation in y equals 1. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Yep. Okay. That's all we need. So where is the absolute minimum? Why is that a difficult question? One, correct. The point one comma negative one is the absolute min. Where's the absolute max? Two comma 16. Done.
the problems. Okay, good. Let's move on to something more interesting, and that is relative extrema. By the way, if you have one of them, it's a minimum. If you have more than one, it's called a minimum. One of them is a maximum. Plural is maxima. Oh, there's the word again. Yeah, good. Yeah. There we go. Relative. We see, so we did this already. Hills and valleys, turning points, max and mins, they're all the same thing. In that little window, where is the highest point? In that little window, where's the lowest point? Okay. The process that we do is exactly the same. Find the critical numbers. All of this starts with finding the critical numbers. Take the derivative, set it equal to zero, solve. But we need to come up with some other way to figure out, is it a max, in other words, a hill, or is it a min, in other words, a valley? So this is what we talked about already, just in calculus speed. Defining a relative max and a relative min. What I didn't mention is the other terminology, local max and local min. I should have brought that up before, which gets confusing. Relative and local are the same thing. Absolute and global are the same thing. However, relative is the more common term. Absolute is the more common term. But occasionally, some smart aleck will throw a global or a local in there just to make things interesting. OK. Find the value of the derivative at each of the relative extrema. All right, go ahead, take the derivative. There are a couple ways to do that. I'd like to see what happens and how you do it. By the way, if you've been paying attention, what should the answer be to the question? No. Zero. Why? Because We're looking for the value of the derivative at the relative maximum. And like we talked about earlier, the relative maximum is where the critical number occurs, which is where the derivative equals zero. Okay, so we're kind of, I'm forcing you to solve a problem which you already know the answer to. More of this was practice for finding the derivative. How many of you found the derivative using quotient rule? No? Nobody? Yeah? Why wouldn't you raise your hand then? How did you do it then? Product rule. So you brought the x cubed up. Did you distribute first? In other words, did you do it this way? You had that, right? And you left it like that and then went crazy on it? Okay, good. Anybody do it a different way? So we got quotient rule, we got straight up product rule. Did anybody split the fraction? Do you know what I mean by split the fraction? No. You could have also said f of x is equal to... 9x to the negative first 
minus 27x to the negative third. Done it that way. Either one. So let's, uh, how ugly does it get when you do product rule, Emily? Okay, so I'm going to use my method in blue. F prime of x is equal to negative 9x to the negative 2 plus 81x to the negative 4. So now we're getting to that point where you'll recall a while ago when I said factoring out stuff will become important later on. Now it becomes important. That derivative, I want it to be set equal to zero so that I can find the critical points or the critical numbers, even though I already know where the critical number is at 3, 2, but I'm pretend I don't. I can't use the zero product rule there because that's not a product, it's a sum. So I have to factor out what I have in common. So I'd factor out a negative 9x. Do I take out the negative second or the negative fourth? Negative fourth. Always the more negative exponent. So that would be x squared minus 9. Which is negative 9x to the negative 4 times x minus 3 times x plus 3. Woohoo! Okay, so that would be negative 9 over x to the 4th times x, whoops, well, plus 3x minus 3. It seems like a silly question, but I'll ask anyways, where are the critical numbers? What makes that derivative equal to zero? Dexter? Zero. Does zero make that derivative equal to zero? No. What does it make that derivative? Uh, hmm? uh, What's the technical mathematical term for having a zero denominator? Undefined. Undefined. Yeah. Okay. Josie, question? Okay. So the problem, the reason I wanted to include this problem also is because we get that negative 9 over x to the fourth thing. I said that we get critical numbers when the derivative equals 0, but now all of a sudden we've got a term where the derivative would be undefined. Is that included as a critical number? And the answer is yes. So we're actually going to revise the definition of a critical number a little bit. Not only is it where the derivative equals 0, but it's also where the derivative is undefined. So our critical numbers for this problem would be 0, 3, and negative 3. And in this particular case, we were looking at the point for 3. So we kind of did the problem backwards. We knew where we were going. We just went around about the way to do it. Questions? Okay. I do have kind of a nasty last example for you. Well, hold on, let me finish with this. So we've got this. The reason we have to consider the derivative not existing is something like the picture on the left. That's what's called a cusp, C-U-S-P. Notice that the function is still continuous. Not that we've really talked about continuous. but that would definitely be a relative maximum. It's the highest point on the graph. But if you took the derivative of that function and set it equal to 0, you would find that that critical number happens when it does not exist. So two reasons, again. We want where the derivative is equal to 0 and where the derivative is undefined. Most of the stuff we're going to deal with is this normal max and min stuff over here on the right. But occasionally, we get this crazy stuff. And we'll, do, we'll talk a little bit more about those in the future. Not only do we have cusps, but we also have corners that show up. That'll be fun. But we'll, say, we'll save that for a while. Okay, these are the things we already talked about. Okay? Critical numbers where the derivative is equal to zero or is non-differentiable. 
you can't take the derivative there, or the derivative is undefined. <coughs> but we knew that already because we've talked about that ad nauseum since we started the lesson, even back in the first picture. This is where we get into, I don't know if we've had, have we had a conversation about uh, golden retrievers yet? Golden retrievers and dogs? Yeah. How's it work? Uh, not all dogs are golden retrievers or something like that. And then yeah, but all dogs that could be golden retrievers. No. All golden retrievers. Oh yeah, that's what I was saying. All golden retrievers are dogs. But not all dogs are golden retrievers. We have the same relationship with relative maxima and critical numbers. All relative max and mins must be critical numbers. But not all critical numbers are max and mins. And we'll see some examples of that as we work through problems. But I wanted to make sure that you understand that relationship. A critical number can be some weird things. It doesn't necessarily make it a relative max and min. But if you have a relative max or min, it must also be a critical number. OK, questions so far? Right. I know your brain's about to explode. Just you'll be okay. I had one more. I was going to have you do this example, but it's a little, it's a little uh, torturous and time-consuming. But uh, finding the critical numbers there, starting by rewriting the cubic root as raising to the one third, take the derivative. It's a lot of tedious work, which we don't have the time for today. Set it equal to zero and solve, and you get those three critical numbers. If you're sitting at home tonight, you've got nothing to do. Feel free to fire up the slideshow and solve that problem. But I'm going to save you the hassles today. We're going to move on. Are you okay with that or did you want to solve it? No. Conrad, you want to jump on that? Oh, I'm good. Uh, you I'm, sure? I'm, yeah, I'm fine. Okay. All right. Really okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm, just, you know, I'm here for you. Okay, great. So that ends this one. Can we get the joke? Family car. No. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> Come on. Relative. Um, Who's talking? Relative something. Relative. Car. I don't know what type of car that is. Nissan That's a Nissan Maxima. Yeah. Relative <laughs> Maxima. <laughs> I think the day's wrong, though. I think we're on day 26, aren't we? Yeah. 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 All right, beautiful. Okay. I thought that would have a bigger response, but I guess I was wrong. Well, I don't know my I get it. If you don't, you know, if you're not real familiar with.